The Sumatran rhino, much like the land that it inhabits, is unlike anything else in this world. Relatively small in size, docile in nature, and sporting a wispy coat of black fur, and with a voice that is reminiscent of a dolphin, the Sumatran rhino surprises and enchants anyone who is lucky enough to see it. It is also arguably the most endangered large mammal on the planet. With a population that is nearly impossible to pinpoint, experts estimate there could be as many as 80, or as little as 30, left in the wild. Although those estimates almost certainly have changed. With a diminishing habitat, the threat of snares and poaching, and decades of frustration to initiate collaborative protection, the Sumatran rhino is at an inflection point. My name is Mike DiGirolamo, your host for Manga Bay Explorers a special podcast series from MangaBay.com's global team, where I speak with experts from the field working to protect the critically threatened forests and animals of Sumatra. Join me bi-weekly as I dive into the unique beauty and key issues of this one-of-a-kind landscape and the people working to protect it. This week, I spoke with Wulan Pusparini and Jeremy Hans. Wulan is a former species conservation specialist from the Wildlife Conservation Society and is a PhD student in environmental conservation at Oxford University. Jeremy is a former senior editor and current contributing writer at Manga Bay, as well as a published author and former conservation blogger for The Guardian. I spoke with Wulan and Jeremy about their work protecting and covering the Sumatran rhino, the unique challenges of conserving them, what is being done currently, and what needs to happen in order to save them from extinction. Speaking with them both shed light on a complicated history of spoiled efforts, delayed action, as well as life-saving conservation and breeding practices, and impactful efforts that are holding the line for this vulnerable mammal. One thing is clear, that while the situation is undeniably dire, the Sumatran rhino has a fighting chance. The routes to rehabilitation are limited, but it just might be enough to save the Sumatran rhino. I'm Jeremy Hans, and I am an, an environmental journalist. I got my start with Manga Bay. I'm currently freelancing, but I, I continue to write as a columnist for Manga Bay. I got my start with the Sumatran rhino in, I think it was 2009, I want to say. I went to Saba in Borneo for a colloquium on orangutans. But as a part of that trip, at the end of the trip, I sort of, uh, at the last minute, we tacked on a few days where I could go visit a, a what was then a recently caught male uh, Sumatran rhino named Tam. Having that, going to visit Tam, meeting Tam, getting, getting to spend a morning with Tam was really a, a life-changing experience. And ever since then, when, whenever there's been a Sumatran rhino story, I'm like the first one to raise my hand. And I've sort of become a, a little bit on the side as a Sumatran rhino journalist. I've done a lot of, I've done two series now for Manga Bay and I've done a lot of coverage in various places. So I'm really passionate about this species. I, I think it's a, a fascinating story. It's, it's not exactly a happy story, but it's one that really continues to be, need to be told. Important to note is that according to Jeremy, the character and the appearance of the Sumatran rhino is one that defies stereotypes. Yeah, well, I think it's important to start with that, the evolutionary history, right? Uh, the Sumatran rhino is unlike any other rhino on Earth. It is a completely different genus from the other five species. So if we lose it, we not only lose the species, we lose an entire genus. It goes back tens of millions of years from when it separated off from the other rhino species. It's also really interesting because it's the, as far as we know, it's the most closely related to the now extinct uh, woolly rhino. Which I think m most of us, you know, when we when we start to learn about prehistoric animals, the woolly rhino really kind of shines out because here's this big shaggy beast in the snow, and it's just such a such a fascinating idea. So there's many things that attracted me to the Sumatran rhino. First was it's it's the smallest rhino in the world, but it's still massive, like it's still a very large animal. But it's also it's it's hairy, like a woolly rhino. It's got this weird shaggy hair, and I think what I was really surprised when I started meeting different Sumatran rhinos. And and the ones I've all met have been in captivity because trying to see them in the wild is, is next to impossible. But getting to meet them and spend time with them is they are very personable. They are very curious. They they come up and they'll sniff you. They're very curious about, uh, you know, strangers in their presence. Um, but they're not aggressive. I've never had, I've never seen one be aggressive towards me or towards anyone. I mean, they can be aggressive, but for the most part, they're, they're very sweet. I had one conservationist describe them as a, a giant sort of cat or dog, right? Like they, they, they become very connected to their, the keepers who work with them. The, the keepers describe them as having very distinct personalities. And so I think that image of a rhino, like our image of a rhino is usually 
like charging and dumb. But I think we are starting to discover, not just with the Sumatran rhino, but with other rhinos too, that there's much more complexity going on there. And the Sumatran rhino, one of the other things that's fascinating is that it makes these strange calls that sound kind of like dolphins or whales. It, it does a strange singing call and, and can make these like clicks and things. And when you're in the presence of one and it starts doing that, it's, it's really an enchanting moment. You as a human are, are, are drawn in by this alien creature really and and it's attempts to sort of communicate its needs and desires and it's just it, it's just every time i've met them it's been a very surreal and almost spiritual experience and i can't always put my finger on why but there's something about them that's really beautiful the rhino speaks in variations of tones that sound similar to a dolphin yet it's very clearly a quality that is entirely unique and even endearing One might wonder what it would take for a docile, charismatic mammal like the Sumatran rhino to find itself on the edge of extinction. The answer is complicated, but Jeremy and Wulan had answers that shed light on the nuance surrounding the rhino's challenges. This is a situation that's been going on for probably thousands of years, in the sense that when, when humans first reached... The, so the Sumatran rhino, used to, it's named after the island of Sumatra, of course, but it used to spread all the way over into eastern India, and it covered all that landmass, then then down all the way you know, through Borneo into Sumatra. What likely happened is, is a combination of, of habitat destruction and probably hunting for thousands of years wiped out populations just one by one by one until we had only a few pockets left. And now we're losing those last pockets. While poaching, hunting, and habitat loss have all played a role, the diminutive population itself means that far less people know about these rhinos than they did previously, making knowing how many of them there are in any one location a gigantic challenge. I think what really striking me about rhino is just like, when I start studying the species, I don't even know that we have two species of rhinos in Indonesia. The one that more popular is the the one horned rhino in Java. Well, like actually the Sumatran rhinos, the only place we have Sumatran rhinos in the world is only in Sumatra, the viable populations. And it's quite striking that not many people know about Sumatran rhinos. It's not uh, it's not as popular as like tigers or like other other species, other cute species like elephants. And from like from conservation perspective as well, they are very hard to study. Because once species are going below a certain point, they get very, very expensive to protect, to study, and it's getting so hard to, to conserve back to their viable populations. And this difficulty in studying the species has hampered efforts to count them in the wild and accurately assess where we stand in terms of a total population, which is crucial to know. The difficulty of trying to save this animal is first that we uh, overestimated how many were left. When I started doing writing about it, and that was like 11, you know, 10, 10 11 years ago, I, th I think the number was 250. Uh, that, was, that was not right. Um, you know, uh, most recently when I've done some in-depth reporting, we came up, uh, up, I believe it was a number between probably like 35 and 80. They used to say around 100, and now they're starting to say less than 80, which is far more accurate. The problem was, is we, people overestimated how many there were in certain areas. They, they thought there was a bunch in certain protected areas, and then they'd actually go in there and they'd find zero. Unlike other species of rhino, the Sumatran rhino leaves usually only small hints of their presence, which complicates efforts to prove their population. Well, it's quite hard with rhinos. The thing with species that's hardly seen, like different with the other rhinos, specifically like, like African rhinos, you can see them and you can count them. With rhinos in the tropics, in the rainforest, you hardly see their signs. I mean, like back in 2007, when I'm starting studying about these species, you walk like in Bukit Barisan Selatan, the place that I was studying from. You walk like um, one kilometer inside the forest and you can see their wallows, their footprints and everything. And you hardly see them. And when people ask, look, how many there are left? You have to have like, you know, a really valid reason to say the numbers. And this is sometimes, this is what we lack of in Sumatra. 
Challenging as well, other than finding them, is establishing where a viable population exists, or in other words, one that can breed, and to date, it appears that only exists in the Loser ecosystem. So those four uh, articles that Jeremy write, I think it's really, really important at that time, and even now, is bring people like more aware of this, the, the fate of this uh, species. And it's really hard to answer that question, actually. So three years ago, we don't know much. We only know like estimate, guesstimate, I guess. We know like the prediction is not good. And I don't think we have another recent estimate. I might be wrong because you know I've been living in Indonesia for a year now, but I don't think I see any you know, significant more study about the fate of the rhinos. One thing that we agree, all of the rhinos conservation is that the numbers are not looking good. And one thing that we know from study is if we have less than 15 rhinos, 15 viable, 15 rhinos that can breed in one single area, they won't be survive in the wild. And we can guess that perhaps rhinos in this area there are like still four areas that we still have wild population of rhino or like or three depends on who you ask only one of them is viable only one of them is like having more than 15 rhino and that's only in loser landscape in the other places i don't think we have enough population to to have them you know survive in the wild jeremy explains further how this fragmentation likely occurred, stemming through fertility issues that were exacerbated by a lack of more females. What likely happened and what we're kind of seeing is that as the rhinos got smaller and smaller populations, the female rhinos would be breeding more and more infrequently, which would then, they would then develop fertility issues, right? Where they basically got to a point where they could no longer have children, whether it was due to getting older, but also due to various kinds of disease within their uterus due to a lack of breeding. So basically you have a mammal that's a very slow breeding mammal in the first place. A female can really only have about one baby every three to four years. And so when you have that much of a slow breeding animal and if they're being hit at all by hunting, poaching, habitat loss, eventually they get to such a small population that they're no longer sus sustaining themselves. And that's what we're kind of seeing right now is that the populations that have been left probably for the last 50 to 100 years have just been too small to continue to produce enough babies to continue to go on. And Wulan corroborates Jeremy's input. So they are solitary animals. And if the female, which is like ready to reproduce, didn't meet uh, the males at the exact time that when they need to mate, it can create a certain issue with the reproductive systems. And there's a lot of uh, sign of that happening in the wild, and the population of rhinos in Borneo, at least. So, one might wonder, didn't anyone see this coming? And did they try to stop it? And the answer is yes. But there were some complications from the historical captive breeding effort. Jeremy explains. Conservationists back in the 80s and 90s decided to capture some of these for a captive breeding program, kind of realizing, I, I think, ahead of their time, that that was one of the methods that needed to happen. But that turned into a complete disaster. They caught 40 animals, if I remember correctly, none of which gave birth in the first decade or so of the program, most of them dying. There was a misunderstanding about what the animals ate. So a lot of them died from a poor diet. There was just, there's was, there's risk in capturing an animal that size. So none of them died at the capture site or certainly thereafter from injuries. And, and then there was a misunderstanding on how to breed them. And that wasn't really cracked until when the Cincinnati Zoo was the first one to actually crack what was missing from the breeding issue. And we were able to get our first birth, uh, which was Andalus, who is still with us. Wulan argues that this could have been avoided had we protected the habitat of Sumatran rhinos along with captive breeding. But now there really is no choice but to have captive breeding which the Sumatran government today is on board with, though it has been delayed due to COVID-19. Back in the 80s, the, the first international conservation meeting for rhinos is like captive breeding. So they start with captive breeding, even back in the 80s. They captured like 40 rhinos from Sumatra and a number of rhinos from Malaysia. But it didn't work. That's in the 80s. If in the 80s you have, you know, split the resources, I don't know, I'm not there, I'm not even born yet. So I couldn't talk for that, you know, uh, history. 
but if at that time you kind of like not just captive breeding because at that time you still have enough rhinos in the wild to have them safe in the wild but of course like it didn't happen and then you know with the palm oil and then you know you start with captive breeding and at that time Alan Rabinowitz uh, right saying that oh you should also have protect them in the wild but it's not happening and you know now in 2015 or 2013 you only have captive breeding of course and like it's a, it's a kind of like of course you that's the only way to go because that's the only way you can go now with rhinos Historically, this was not the only issue, of course. Getting collaborative efforts requires agreement amongst conservationists, and without it, it's difficult to convince governments to jump on to any one pathway to rehabilitation. I think we overestimated how many rhinos were left. We underestimated how hard it was going to be to breed these animals, and we're simply at this point running out of time. We now have a situation where the rhino is very likely extinct in Malaysia. The last captive one died uh, last year. And we have only a few rhinos in captivity in Indonesia. And there has just been a lot of government foot dragging on making concrete decisions and taking action. And and it's not all the government's fault in the sense that conservationists have also been a lot of disagreements on what to do. And when a government hears two different sides, they will often say, "Okay, well, we'll just continue to do what we've been doing. Or they'll go with a less controversial option. And I think that that has lost us some time. I'm feeling a little bit hopeful now that maybe things are going to start to change. While there is reason to hope things are starting to change, Wulan further explains the financial and time-intensive process of capturing rhinos in the wild and the importance of acknowledging the difficulty behind this process. I think with working with the government, I, I think this is true whether you're working with governments or you know any other places. If you have a, an idea, you have to prove that it works, right? If you say like, oh, we have to count the rhino so we know whether we protect them in the right way or not. The thing is, it's very hard to count this rhino. If it's a tiger, so I also work with the Sumatran tiger. You can not easily, but relatively easy, easily spread out like 200 camera traps in the forest, leave them for like three months, and then uh, take them all, download all the pictures, and then you can do like statistic and then you get the numbers. That's not the case with the rhinos. You can spread out these hundreds of camera traps. And, you, well, we did it a bit late as well. But even back in 2007, so I analyzed the camera trap from WCS, we don't see that many rhinos in the pictures, unlike the tigers. So that's clearly like we cannot use the same method that we use for tigers to study rhinos. I think even at that time, 2007, the only way to accurately monitor the population of rhino is doing like fecal DNA kind of study. And it's quite hard to do. It is quite hard to convince someone or, you know, even a system to do something that you think right if you cannot, you know, prove that, hey, guys, this is the way to do. And I, you know, I do some pilot and this is like some result. I think this is a good idea. I think think we, we should pursue this. This is quite hard to do. So what I propose at that time is this um, is this method called occupancy modeling. So it's simply using the presence and absence of the rhino signs and you know binomial modeling, and then you get this index of populations. And it's quite hard to convince people to do that, but eventually in 2010 the idea took took off. A lot of people gaining interest and also like. The method itself has been used in a number of other mammals, and it's proven to be working. But sadly, in 2000, you know, when we start to do that, the number of rhinos, at least in Bukit Barisan Selatan, when we pilot the method, is already like so, so low, and we don't find like enough signs. And what makes things even more complicated, if you go inside the forest, you're not really familiar with rhino footprints. There's other species which have like similar footprints, the tapir. So they both are uh, from the pterodactyls families and they both have like similar uh, footprints. And at that time with uh, people not seeing the rhino footprints enough, so the I think the team doesn't have enough you know, training to differentiate between the rhinos and the tapir footprints. So there's a lot of cases of false positive, which make things more complicated and the method just not working. 
Another challenge that Jeremy brings up is genetic diversity and efforts to breed rhinos from populations in locations that would have offered a set of completely different genes. But this too experienced a hang-up, which led to the window closing on what could have been an additional route for successful breeding. So what, what, what happened is we had a male rhino named Tam who they wanted to try and send sperm, his sperm, to Indonesia and attempt to uh, impregnate one of the females at, in, in Way Canvas, one of the captive females. And we also had a, a female named Iman who they wanted to try and get some sperm from the fertile male Andalus to, to attempt to pregnant her. This dra dragged on for years. At the time, Malaysia was down to really just two, two to three rhinos. They had, they had a, a third female for, uh, another female for a little while. But the male sperm was not really quality enough, they thought. So they wanted to try a, a male, a, a known breeder, basically. And they couldn't get it. And then she passed away without them being able to ever get that. Now Malaysia is looking at truly basically like a, a, a kind of an operation where they would take some of the, I think some of the eggs left over from Iman and attempt to put them into another species of rhino to see if they can produce a new, a basically kind of a, a, a new Bornean rhino, a Sumatran rhino from that. That is something that's at the very beginning stages and is going to encounter probably a number of technical challenges, but is not impossible. They might be able to make that happen, but that is one hopeful thing. But again, there, there was, there was throughout a lack of cooperation between Indonesia and Malaysia that certainly hampered our efforts to move forward to at least try, you know, uh, there was no, there was no guarantee of success, but to at least try some new things and to, to mix the population. The population in Malaysia was a very different genetics. So they could have gotten some new genetics out of this. We could have at least tried, and that has now passed. Like there's really, because there's no living rhinos uh, in Malaysia, it's no longer an option. Like Wulan mentioned previously, there really are only three or four locations left where rhinos are known to exist. Jeremy explains what the numbers in these locations are believed to be. And it's important to note that one of them is home to the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary, which is in Way Canvas. Currently, the rhinos are found in potentially four places. Bukit Barisan, as you mentioned, might have a rhino. I would be surprised if it does, but it's possible. Last I heard, they were continuing to survey. When I visited there, there was a lot of red flags, even though there was a lot of insistence that there was probably still rhinos there. There was also a lot of red flags that showed that it might not be. That was three years ago. And if you have, let's say, two or three rhinos left in, a, in an ecosystem like Bukit Barisan, even with the best rhino rangers and stuff, it if they're old individuals, if they get caught in one trap, if something happens, right, you could very easily lose those rhinos in a few years. So I, I would be surprised. I, I know that if they do find anything in Bukit Barisan, I think the plan is to capture them. Way Canvas probably has, last I heard, about 20 to 30 animals left. That is where the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary is. I know that there is a plan to capture maybe around three animals from there. Uh, I don't think there's been any headway. I'm guessing all of this is on hold right now because of COVID-19. It also can, it's going to take a long time to capture an animal successfully, but I do know that they were looking at, at three individuals. Kalimantan, we have one rhino in captivity. There's at least, I think, one other rhino that they were following that they wanted to capture. But again, I think that's on hold. I would hazard the population of Kalimantan is probably one, two, three rhinos. It's probably a very small amount left. And then there's Lucer, uh, which you talked about on the, on the last podcast. And that is probably where the largest population still persists. And from last we've heard from Manga Bay reporting, there are some babies there. So that's incredibly good news. But there's also plans there, and I think it's very smart, to capture some rhinos there and to get them in for captive breeding. And I do think that they also have a couple rhinos there that they don't think are connected to the other populations. So there is plans in place now. This is relatively recent to capture rhinos. But the problem is really is like this all got started. Plans were being made. Buildings are being built. And then COVID-19 hit and everything got put on hold. So taking the lessons learned from the past, I asked Wulan to distill just exactly what we needed in order to produce more rhinos. Rhinos are very sensitive. So the only place that we know they can breed is the Sumatra Rhino Sanctuary in Waikambas or the Cincinnati Zoo. Like, of course, we don't want them like in the zoo. If we want to consolidate populations, uh, a place like SRS, Sumatra Rhino Sanctuary, is a, is a good way to go. You know, like when we try to save the species, we try to save them in their ecosystem because we don't want to just save the species per se, but we, we want to save them because they have these ecosystem functions. I think for Rhino, it's kind of too late to do that for this 
species that are stranded in the dune populations. What we can is save them as a species first, and then we think of like how to get them back in the wild. But if we have 15 rhino with, you know, with good uh, sex ratio, and they are like breeding, theoretically, they can bunch back to a viable conditions. Or if you, I think the number is, so we have this viable population analysis of rhinos back in 2000, I forgot, 15 or something. So if you have 15 really good condition of rhinos, uh, populations, individual, individual rhinos, or like 40s rhinos, you can have them safe in the wild. I believe there's still a place that we have them, have uh, that many rhinos in one area. But for other locations that are clearly not the only way, which I think most of the rhinos conservationists agree is, to consolidate the populations and have them breeding get them stabilized in a good population, a good number of individuals. And then we can think of how to, you know, release them back in the wild, which is not an easy fit to do, right? not even for tigers. Jeremy also stated that around 15 captive breeding rhinos with a roughly 7-7 split of male and females would be needed. And it's not impossible, but what is challenging is the sustained decades-long effort this would take before we'd be able to release any rhinos back into the wild. In some ways, it's a little bit of getting ahead of ourselves to say, okay, you know, let's, if we get a bunch of rhinos into captivity and breed them, can we then re-release them somewhere and protect them? I mean, really, if, if we're looking at, and, and I think we do need to think about the long term, but we're talking probably, that's probably 50 years away and 50 years of success. With the slow breeding of the species, with the few rhinos are left, in order to breed enough to build up a secure enough population to start releasing them back in the wild, uh, we, it would take decades. So I think, I think for me at least, the immediate focus needs to be on protecting the two main populations that are there, which is way canvas and looser, and then identifying individuals for capture, and then just getting those in, you know, just breeding the heck out of them. We haven't had a Sumatran rhino baby born in captivity since 2016. That's four years ago. As far as I know, none, none of the females in captivity are pregnant, and their pregnancy lasts a long time, a lot longer than I think it's about 18 months. We are continually up against the clock and we need to get new rhinos. We especially need young female rhinos that are capable of breeding. The, the, the great thing is that the Indonesian staff that work with these rhinos are amazing, the, the veterinarians and the staff. And I do think that if they had a few healthy younger rhinos, they could probably get quite a few babies and we could continue this process. And then hopefully, yeah, hopefully 50 years down the road, 30 years, 40 years, whatever, we could then re-release them in a very secure location and, and, and keep them safe and build up the population that way. Maybe even bring them back to Malaysia, you know, bring them back to Vietnam. You know, that, that is not outside the realm of possibility, but it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of support from the government, which their, their environmental policies can be quite controversial <laughs> to put it you know, uh, and a lot of the deforestation in Indonesia is terrible, but they have been putting some pretty good support behind rhinos specifically. Uh, it just needs to be ramped up, and we really need to focus, I think, on captures before we get anywhere else. Mongabe reached out to Terry Roth at the Cincinnati Zoo regarding whether a rhino had gotten pregnant recently, and one has, but it is not sustaining the pregnancy. Hormone supplements have been found to help in the past, but in this case are not helping the female rhino in question. However, there is another female in captivity named Pahu, and Terry has said that she is being evaluated to determine her fertility and what the next best steps for her are. Wulan has said that bringing Pahu to the SRS in Way Canvas would be the ideal move due to the fact that Andalas, a male rhino being kept there, is known to be fertile. Further incentive here is the fact that there is only one other known fertile female at the SRS named Ratu, and Pahu could be a viable alternative. And yet, the battle doesn't end here. There is still the poaching crisis to contend with, which Ulan explained has a history that appears to be repeating itself with other mammals beyond the rhino. But, you know, this is rhinos. It's very hard to save, even if you you know, collect them like in a captive breeding situation, then they're not breeding that easily. But if if we if we take rhinos as like one very exact ex expensive uh, learned uh, 
species to so people can learn from. We still have other species like elephants and tigers in Sumatra, and now they are, you know, they they're facing the same problems like rhinos in the nineties, in the two thousands. So uh, there's a lot of poaching for rhinos in the nineties. I guess like we still have poaching for rhinos, I guess, but not that many because we don't have that many rhinos left. But poaching for elephants and tigers like it's keep happening at the at the you know at the rate that are not sustainable, of course. And you know this the snare crisis all over Southeast Asia is also in in Sumatra, which like you know snare all of these species indiscriminately. Every species you know gets snared and they all die off. When we saying that we rhino is an expensive, uh, you know, things to learn for the government. Well, I guess not. Not really. We're still facing the same problem, but just for different species. A problem that Wulan mentions is very real still for rhinos, and it's one of the many reasons that identifying their location in the wild can come with some very hard consequences. Even like, for example, like if I found. A new population of rhino somewhere in Sumatra, and they're like in a very you know good condition, viable condition. I will choose to be silent about that and just protect them. Their number are like so so low. What you need is a bit, is a very good protection strategy. You don't even like want public to know you know the map of the locations because they're horn like so so valuable. And there's an organized organized crime that will target them. So what you want is actually just make them safe. If that you know happened, do the study. If you're finding out that oh they still have you know like twenty rhinos here and it's good condition, okay, just stay silent and just protect that area. If like for example it's only like five rhinos, okay, like move them from that place and move them into you know. Uh, SRS or, like, or a sanctuary with uh, good protections. Rhinos are not as easy to hunt, unlike elephants or tigers, because there are so few of them. But even even if you you know kind of announce, oh, we found a new species of a new population of rhinos, like what WWF did in Borneo, and you know, and when you come back to that area, like Najak, you found like the snare traps in her feet. Jeremy elaborates on the importance of RPUs, or Rhino Protection Units, to sustaining these populations, and how more resources need to be poured into them, but that cracking down on snares is imperative. I, I think I think Ranger Protection Units are vital. I do, uh, because of uh, poaching, and even more than poaching, honestly, is the snaring issue. Most of the hunters in these areas are not going to be going in there looking for rhino, because they're not going to, these rhinos are very hard to find, and they're quite cryptic. So it's it's in a many ways, and, and a number of the rhinos that have been captured uh, have been through snares. You know, they get caught in a snare left out for a pig or a deer or something like that, and and that can be that can kill them uh, or injure them for life. Wulan was actually the lead author on a study that the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the WCS contributed to that identified priority forest patches to better assist RPUs. They labeled them as intensive protection zones, identifying where the rhinos were, and this data was critical in continuing to protect them. Yeah, that's also quite interesting. So when I come to uh, Sumatra, it was 13 years ago, right? So I'm studying in this one park, Bukit Barisan Selatan National Park, and we have rhino protection unit there, which has been uh, around since 98. So they're doing quite a good job protecting, you know, patrolling the whole area. I got my first job from Nico Van Schrein to analyze this patrol data. So what I did is quite simple, really. It's nothing, you know, there's no fancy analysis included. So what I did is just like collecting all of this uh, information of patrol from back to 95 from from three national park, the Bukit Barisan Selatan National Park, Kerinci Seblat, and Waikambas, and simply just divided the number of signs that I find and the kilometers they patrol. What makes it quite a bit complicated is just because at that time, they don't have, you know, the advanced GPS handheld, so they're still using the the paper map, so we, you know, we, we're using the, the paper map and we're digitally digitizing them. So we have the, the digital versions. And then we calculate the kilometer they walk and then just simply divided the number of 
rhino signs they find in the kilometers. It's not perfect, but just from that simple summary statistic, we found that the number of signs that they find per kilometers is decreasing. So it begs for further analysis, right? Because we don't, we might miss something, you know, the patrol that they walk on might miss area that there's more rhinos, but no patrol and things like that. So one thing that I learned from that uh, first job is to propose to the to the organization that I work for, the, the Rhino Protection Unit at that time, to have, uh, you know, population monitoring in place because... You know, patrolling is one form of conservation actions, but to to measure how how good your action is, you have to have a baseline. You have to know how many there are. Like simply, like you have to know whether your actions have an impact in the population that you're trying to protect. So that's what I propose to have. You know, some kind of population monitoring, and we don't have that many resources yet. Unlike today, that we can do the fecal DNA analysis to the rhinos, we don't have that much resources, I guess, and not much um, interest, I guess, to do population monitoring. So people, I think the the interest at that time only like protect and protect, and protect, you know, do the patrol and patrol, but not really, uh, you know, stop stop a while and see whether we we do enough patrol and whether like no, we have to switch gear, you know doing more investigation and things like that. One of the individuals that Wulan worked with, who was respected for doing the more difficult task of finding this information, was a man named Nico Van Strien. So Nico Van Strien is the only person, I think, that uh, studied the smart rhinos in the wild. So he did this back in 85. Well, he published it in 85. I I think he started doing it in the 70s for his doctoral thesis in Lucer in the Mamas Valley. He go there, I think he camped there like many months, and then he actually following the rhinos and making this plaster cast of each of the footprints. And he has like many of them, and he compare the, the size of that footprint. And from that, you can estimate the number of rhinos there. That's insane. I mean, like, I think he's the only one that had a chance to study these rhinos in the wild. So he did that in the he did that in the seventies. But I don't think there's other at least like published study on the rhinos in the wild. So I'm doing my undergraduate thesis, and like his book is the only source that I can find. I come to Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary in Waikambas unannounced. Like nobody, he didn't expect me to come. As well, I could just come there with a motorcycle and just like knock the door and then just talk to him. And he seems like so glad to to meet me and talk. I don't think he believed that somebody's like have the interest to study about this species. And then so we talk a lot about my my study at that time. So I'm comparing the data from the patrol unit and the camera trap. And once I finish with my study, my bachelor degree, I come to the RPU and help to analyze this patrol data, which has, you know, piled up since the 1995, at least. But I don't have quite a lot of chance uh, to work with him because, sadly, so I joined the RPU in February 2007, I guess. But then Nico passed away in the early year of 2008. I think one thing that I remember is, like, his love of this species, you don't, I don't know, like the way conservationists work now, we, we stuck more in the laptop and running our models. And the kind of conservationists that actually go to the forest and, you know, making a plaster cast, you know, kind of like, uh, not old, but, you know, the, the field biologist field is, it's so different with what we have now. I think what what makes this kind of people powerful is because you know that they've been studying this species for so long. Their voice has a power. If Nico said something about this rhino, people will believe him. But if like other biologists like me say something about this rhino, you don't get the same power, you know. There's a lot of voices, there's a lot of opinions. To reach a compromise, to actually start doing something, 
sometimes it takes toll to the species. You know, you do a lot of meetings, you do a lot of compromise, but you don't do the work in the ground. But if you have someone that people see as the authority of this species, and when he says something, you know, this is the best that uh, will work for this species, and people can, oh, okay, okay, let's agree on that point, and then let's start working. While Nico's passion is missed, Wulan believes there is a lot of promise in the young generation of conservationists who have increased support and incentives to study due to programs provided by the Indonesian government itself. The, the conservation, at least in Sumatra for the last 20 years, I guess, there's a lot of things happening, a lot of things changing, and it's not, it's not the same anymore. Like in the old days, like you have the one single powerful voice like Nico for rhinos. But now if you see, like, uh, we don't necessarily have that, but I guess perhaps we don't necessarily need that anymore. In the, in the old days, the, the, I'm sorry to say that, but the expert is always foreigners coming to study the, 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 this exotic species in this faraway land. And then they publish and they might have like one or two local people to help them. But now if I see my peers or even conservation is much, much younger than me, they're like much, there are many younger conservationists that much, much smarter than I ever be at when I was their age, you know. Like things are progressing very quickly in terms of like science and technology. And that's the things that we need. We don't need one hero to save all, but we need many conservationists working together to have some change. And I think that's happening now. So for example, start in 2012, the Indonesia government has this very good program, it's the Indonesia Endowment uh, Fund for Education, in which like if you get accepted in 20 best university of the world, the, the government will just pay it for your school. No matter how you know, no matter how expensive is that. So we have many Indonesian graduates which are studying, you know, conservation biology, uh, environmental law, you know, you know, climate change, or like indigenous people, like or like anthropogenic study, which has like interest in conservations, and graduated from the best university in the world. And it's not it's not just like one or two. There's like many of them, and you know, with the 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 open the open science and technology, there's a lot of things that can happen. So, for example, like if you want to study the the elephants in the old days, you have to do this line transect and you have to collect all of their feces, you know, and you, you do this complex calculation of their decay rate, and you have the number. But now, like, you can do fecal DNA, you can just collect the, the fecal, and from that you can know the, the age of these elephants, you know the, you know, the, the kinship relationship with these elephants and everything. And you can have this at much, much quicker compared to the old days. And, and we don't have to rely on foreign experts to do that anymore. I mean, like Indonesia, I think it will be good you know, to always open to collaboration, but having this skill in national conservation is, is also a good thing, and it starts happening. Needless to say, governments are never perfect, but Wulan stresses that while it may be easy or justifiable to point out when a government is doing something wrong, it's also important to work with and guide the government into solutions that benefit the conservation mission. But I think one thing that people also sometimes forget, like when you talk about conservations, the easiest thing is, you know, oh, talk to the government and say, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, you don't do a good job, and so you should be ashamed of yourself. There's a lot of like approach like that, you know, like blaming the government. But the that's the easiest thing to do, I, I think. But the hardest, the much more harder and much more impactful, actually, the things that you can do is actually work with the government. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Like, this place that I'm talking, the Bukit Barisan Selatan, we've been there since 1995 or something, which is like, I don't know, 25 years. Conservation is a long game. If, you, if you're interested in conservation, you have to stick it on for the long game. 
And one of the way that people often don't care is to actually work with the government because it's so much easier to just blame the government for everything, but it won't have any impact. So what? Like you blame the government and they're angry with you and then you get banned or if you're a foreigner, you get deported. But And then the government is changing every five years. So if you actually really care with the, the force that you're working on, stay there for the longer game, you know, uh, work with the staff of the national park that actually there. And out of all of those staff, there's, there, there are a lot of, you know, good people, good persons. Build them, build their capacity, uh, the younger staff, support them, I don't know, finding them a scholarship to study and build them up. If you do that, well, we, we, uh, the WCS did that like for many years. Those stuff that you, you know, accompany along their, their way of career, I guess, they will, once they, they finish their education, they will be, you know, someone more, more senior in the ministry or the government. And those person going to make an impact. Jeremy agrees with this and believes there is ample opportunity for conservationists and NGOs to get involved more with the Indonesian government to devise a more comprehensive and transparent breeding program. It is this that Jeremy rests his hope upon. I, I think I think I would I would love to see the government come out with a with a more transparent national breeding program for rhinos that would say, okay, here's our goal, here's our target for how many rhinos we want captured. Uh, here's the funding we're going to put into it. We want a goal of producing, you know, of, of having 10 new rhinos by 2030 or something like that. You know, just again, just something that that's sort of aspirational and exciting. You know, there are a lot of NGOs. National Geographic is now involved. There's a lot of great groups that have sort of gotten into this. And and there's a whole kind of co coalition now called the Sumatran Rhino Rescue, which is sort of heading up these captures or at least involved in trying to get these to happen. But I think for me, my concern is that it's going to become very regional again and that rhinos and lucer will only be bred with rhinos and lucer and rhinos and weight canvas will only be bred with rhinos, when really we should be mixing these groups for their genetic viability and also just for better chances of breeding. And so I think I'd love to see a little more transparency and obviously I'd love to see more money and support, but I also understand that, you know, the Indonesian government has lots of different things pushing and pulling it and and even in, and obviously in conservation there's a lot of different things you could be supporting but i will say that the sumatran rhino is probably the most endangered large mammal in the world and it is split between three to four locations with probably only a number of females viable left so if we don't act now it's over Unless we start like, unless, I mean, basically then we were talking about science fiction, like cloning them down the road, which is not impossible, but I would rather see that we can do this. And I think that we can. I mean, we, I think that if we get a few, just a few healthy females, we can produce some babies and get better at it. And over time, I think we can produce a viable captive population. And then as you say, the goal would be then to re-release them back into the wild eventually. Wulan remains optimistic and stresses the importance of recognizing that there are more ways to help contribute to the conservation of the Sumatran rhino than one might realize. I'm not a hopeless person. I'm quite optimistic. If I'm not, like I already like left this field like 10 years ago, perhaps. So there are a lot of good things happening in conservation, that's for sure. There's a lot of like small victories won, you know, over the years. And there's a lot of side of conservation. And if, if you care about the biodiversity, you know, climate justice is social justice now. There's a lot of role that you can play, even if you're not studying biology or like or modeling or something. One of those ways it should be mentioned is through the work Jeremy Hans has done with his new book, Baggage, Confessions of a Globetrotting Hypochondriac, which has what can be fairly described as an emotionally powerful examination of Jeremy's encounter with the Sumatran rhino and the importance of conserving the species. The, the book is really about, it's an inside look at what it is like to be an environmental journalist who travels abroad, uh, but who also struggles with OCD, anxiety, and depression. And so it's really about all the ridiculous situations I get myself into, while also being about the animals and the places and the people and why I continue to do this, even though travel for me is really hard. So the second time I went to Indonesia, I went very specifically to to write a series of, of articles on the Sumatran rhino for Manga Bay. And that re that required, you know, flying into Jakarta and then traveling uh, overland through Java and then getting on a boat 
over to Sumatra, then traveling overland like another eight hours to the sanctuary and spending a few days there. And then we went south to, or not south, sorry, we went west to Bukit Barisan, which is on the other side of, of southern Sumatra. And I spent time with the rhino rangers there and did some hiking there and stuff. And so it's really about, you know, the, the stories I tell in the book are stories that don't appear in my journalism as much. They're really more my personal experiences, my personal observations. But I I love traveling in, in, in Indonesia for the culture. The people are so warm and wonderful. The food is some of the best food I've ever had in my life. But it's also really hard to travel in Indonesia sometimes because the driving is crazy. The cultural differences can be intense at times. You know, I don't speak the language. I don't speak any language. And so it's the, the story is sort of about, you know, someone like me with with who's having panic attacks or anxiety moments uh, doing these kinds of trips and then, you know, still making it through and coming back and trying to tell this species story. Sumatra is such a beautiful, incredible island of such strange creatures. And I think being there is always wonderful and beguiling, but also really hard because of the amount of destruction. And you talked about that last time, uh, the amount of destruction that's happening on the island that you see with your own eyes when you're there. And a lot of that destruction is not even necessarily for local people. It's 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 for large corporations that are just uh, wasting the jungle away and the animals and and resources for local villagers and people that are depending on that forest for, you know, thousands of years. It's an it's an emotional up and down ride of an experience. But I would really, you know, if, if someone's looking for a, a place to visit, there's there's really no more rich place in terms of culture and, and wildlife um, than a place like Sumatra or Indonesia in general. Indonesia itself is just a a wonderful experience. So with so many species facing difficult roads ahead and time and resources that are already stretched thin, one may be wondering, why the Sumatran rhino? Wulan had a very clear answer. We have to admit that if you're talking conservation without having, you know, a, a species as an icon, people that don't necessarily work in this field cannot have, you know, have a connection with that. And there's a lot of species that need to be safe in Indonesia, like the corals, uh, the the plants, the animals. But if we lose like the orangutan or the tigers of Sumatra or the elephants, it's quite hard to find a replacement for, you know, with other charismatic species. So just having, just knowing that these four mega charismatic species are safe in Sumatra, if we can't even save this mega charismatic people that that's so easy for people to have you know emotional connect connection with what can we do for other species if we can't even save this mega charismatic species which is which are like in Sumatra, i don't think we have a chance to save the other species i would like to thank wulan for taking the time to speak with manga bay and for her contributions to helping protect the one-of-a-kind sumatran rhino and to jeremy for his continued reporting and writing, which has raised crucial awareness. Special thanks to the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago for their help with the music heard during today's conversation. Manga Bay Explorers is an ongoing podcast series diving into environmental stories from around the globe. Be sure to check out the previous episode in this series, which covers the history of Sumatra's challenges and the context of what it faces going forward. Watch for a new edition of Manga Bay Explorers every two weeks, in between episodes of our flagship podcast, the Manga Bay Newscast. Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters. Download our new app for Apple and Android devices to gain fingertip access to all our new shows and all our previous episodes. We also ask that if you enjoyed this show, please tell a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. Manga Bay is a nonprofit news provider, so we rely on the generosity of our listeners, readers, and friends. To add your support, head to patreon.com forward slash manga bay to learn more. Keep up with all of Manga Bay's news from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com or get updates via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is at manga bay. Thank you once again, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Manga Bay Explorers.